All right, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Bob Bruner. I am the a &R Extension Educator for Clay and Owen Counties. And tonight we're gonna be talking about monarchs. Um, I love this program because I'm an entomologist myself and I love finding monarchs out in nature. Um, there are very few things that stand out in our ecosystem that time of year like the monarch butterfly does. Its wings are very bright, very, very striking and obvious. And they always seem to enjoy plants that also stand out themselves. And tonight, we're going to be talking about a little bit of both. Like I said, I'm going to be talking about the monarch itself and its biology and how it migrates. And Tabby Flynn this evening is going to be talking about a lot of the host plants that monarchs rely on. So before we dive into that, I want to address first what is a monarch butterfly or what is a butterfly in general. So monarchs belong to a group that's formerly known as Lepidoptera. We as entomologists, we love to classify things. And when we refer to insects, we often refer to the order they belong to. Um, an order of insects is normally defined by a very, very common morphological feature they all share, like either they have hardened wings or they are sap feeders or something along those lines. In the case of monarchs and most butterflies, they have wings that are covered in scales Thus, their Latin name, Lepidoptera, which means scaly wings. The most notable feature, obviously, are these wings because they have really, really bright color patterns on them. Or in the case of their other family members, the moths, their wings are dingy and brown. But no matter what, they have some amount of scales that cover them. These insects are also defined by having a really, really interesting life cycle in that they start as an egg, they become they hatch into a larva or caterpillar, eventually turning into a pupa or chrysalis, and then they become an adult by entering an imago stage. And we're going to go over that just a little bit in a, in a little while. So this close-up image, I absolutely adore. I was very lucky to be able to have gotten this one, I feel like. This is a close-up of the wing of a butterfly, and you can very, very clearly see the scales on the wings. You can see how it's got that kind of almost pixelated pattern on it. And I'm sure a lot of you have discovered this on your own already, but if you rub your fingers along the wing, you'll have little pow powdery substance come off on your fingers. Those are the scales that are on those wings. They're very, they, they're not real firmly attached. They're meant to kind of come off a little bit. Um, and you'll find that whether you're handling a butterfly or a moth. Now, the big question when it comes to scales, and one of the most interesting facts about them, is we ask, where does that color come from? So the color arises from the way the insect handles some of the more toxic materials that it's forced to consume. So caterpillars, since they're primarily herbivores, with very few exceptions, they are on plants that have developed what we refer to as a secondary compound or some kind of toxin that's intended to make herbivores not consume that plant. Larva could easily be killed by this. This is why the plant adapted this ability. So what larva or caterpillars have done is they've also adapted a defense. What they'll do is they will consume the plant and then any toxic materials that are in that plant, they're going to sequester in their bodies. And that toxic material isn't gonna get digested. It's just going to sit there closed off from the rest of their bodily systems and then when they become adults, that those sequestered chemicals are going to become stored in the scales on the wings. That's where they're all going to end up. That's also why we get such bright, bright colors. In the case of the monarch, we see bright oranges or yellows come out because they consume their primary host of milkweed or Asclepias species. Now, milkweeds have a toxin in them that acts as a kind of toxic latex sap. Most animals can't successfully consume this. And if you look at the different insects that you can find on milkweed, you're going to notice that whether they're a butterfly or whether they're something that looks a little bit like a squash bug or something like that, they're all oranges and reds, really, really bright, obvious colors. The reason for this is, is that the material that they're consuming, cardolinides, um, are that toxic sap and it produces that color when it's stored in their bodies. Now, this color serves more than one purpose, too. Not only is it just them protecting themselves against the plant's defenses, it also gives them a warning. 
so that anything that sees them is going to see the warning of, I'm not safe to eat, don't touch me. A nice defensive coloration benefit. So monarchs are perhaps the primary example that I like to refer to when I talk about defensive coloration because it's so very, very obvious. It's very hard to miss. It sends a, a message to all predators that whatever you're thinking about eating right here, if it's this bright color, it's extremely poisonous or very, very distasteful, or it can do any number of things to you. If we were looking at the world of mammals, let's put it this way. Would you walk up to a skunk? That bright white along the black is a warning. It's telling you, I'm, don't mess with me or I'm going to do something to you. And the same is true for monarch butterflies. This is really fascinating to me as an entomologist because I see this as the insect is using something in the host plant to create a defense for itself. And I think that's just fascinating. So this leads kind of back around to how do butterflies feed on these things? A lot of you are gardeners. So you're probably already very, very familiar with caterpillars and how they feed. They have chewing mouth parts that are going to rip up and tear up the leaves of the plants you value the most. And a lot of these caterpillars are doing exactly that to Asclepias species or milkweed. However, the adults of monarchs, actually they don't chew anything. They have mouth parts that we call a proboscis that they use like a straw. Now, when we talk about butterflies in general, they may or may not consume food. Some butterfly species don't consume food at all. All they do is they just live long enough to breed with the opposite sex, reproduce, and then they die within a couple of days. They just burn through the energy they reserved when they were caterpillars. Monarchs, however, have a lot of different behaviors, including migration. So their life is very energy intensive and they're gonna consume nectar where they can get it. So they have a digestive tract and they have mouth parts, that proboscis that they use as a straw. Now, one thing I always have to talk to people about a lot is a little bit of myth busting here when it comes to butterflies. Butterflies cannot bite or sting you. They do not have any parts on their bodies capable of that. Um, one of my favorite myths is that somehow butterflies can uh, bite and drain blood out of a person. That is just not true. So take it from me. You don't have to worry about butterflies doing any kind of damage to you. And if you're curious, here's look inside the red circle you see in front of you right now. That funny bent thing is the straw, is the mouth part on the butterfly that's dipping down into the nectar well on the flower that they're sitting on. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how these guys reproduce. So I'm gonna first talk about butterflies and moths in general, and then we're gonna go into what monarchs in particular do. So like I said earlier, adults may or may not feed, but they are definitely going to mate and lay eggs and then die. Unless in the case of monarchs, they're going to survive to be able to go back and migrate again. And different butterfly species may survive past laying eggs for a generation. It just depends on which ones you're looking at. Now the eggs, depending on when they're laid, are going to either hatch after a few weeks or they're going to stay eggs throughout the winter and then hatch the following spring. And the eggs will be very, very tiny. You can look on the surface of plant leaves to find uh, those belonging to different species, but some butterflies and moths are just going to lay their eggs and let them drop onto the ground near the plant that they're going to be consuming. Most of them are going to be putting the eggs that contain their larva near the host plant they want them to eat. So that way they're providing a little bit of parenting there. Caterpillars, once they're out of their eggs, are gonna go ahead and climb onto their host plants and they're going to proceed as they consume that host plant to go through several moltings where they're going to shed their skin because they have their bones on the outside. They're covered in an exoskeleton, just like the adults. As they eat, they get bigger and they need to shed that exoskeleton to be able to grow larger. You may hear entomologists or master gardeners refer to the space in between a molting as an instar. It's something we kind of use to mark out the age of a larva and to identify a species because the number of instars it has, the number of times in between molts can really tell us what species it is. Uh, caterpillars will eventually form what's called a chrysalis or a pupa. Sometimes you may hear it referred to as a cocoon and they're gonna stay in that cocoon for several weeks while their body basically breaks down and then rearranges itself into its adult form. 
And then eventually, of course, we get back to having an adult butterfly or moth and the whole cycle gets started again. Now, in the case of monarchs, what we see, we see that the monarch butterfly is going to lay its egg directly on the host plant. And you can actually look and they're generally, they're only going to lay a single egg on a single host plant. If you've seen monarch caterpillars in action, you know they can get fairly large. So they don't wanna to put too many eggs in one spot because then they're going to be competing for the food resources they have. The larvae are going to stay on that host plant and they're gonna move through five instars. So they're gonna molt about five times, five or six times, uh, but they'll have those five instars. And then what they're going to do is they're going to form their pupa or chrysalis on the plant itself. And you're gonna see that little kind of bag, green, bright green bag shape. If you look towards the uh, right side of the screen and look at the bottom pie slice there, you can see it. That's the chrysalis. And it's gonna start out this kind of very bright jade-like green. And then as the pupa develops further, it'll become translucent and you'll actually be able to see the butterfly inside of it. That's going to happen for about two weeks. Now, this is all very, very dependent on temperature as well. Insects rely on temperature very, very heavily for their development, whether they're an egg, a caterpillar, or in a pupa. The better, the higher the temperature is, the faster they'll develop. So two weeks is probably your optimal speed at the optimal temperature. So one of the big things that I like to talk to you about, especially with monarchs, is their migratory pattern. This is one of the most unique aspects of this group of butterflies, and it's one of the most important ones. Um, we see that a lot of uh, NGOs and a lot of other organizations focus on protecting monarchs at, throughout their yearly migratory pattern. Now, there are two breeding groups one exists west of the Rockies. We here in Indiana see the one that exists east of the Rockies. So the one that's west of the Rockies is going to do their overwintering in California and the southern reaches of that state, whereas the one that we see overwinters in Mexico. So they travel quite a bit of distance. And their uh, migration pattern is multi-generational. So the butterflies that start their migration will not be the ones that end their migration here in Indiana. So this screen that you're looking at now kind of shows that. So you can see that, that where they start in Mexico, where it says F0, imagine F0 means those are the parents. And then they travel north and give birth to the F1 generation, the first set of children, who then they, they themselves reproduce. And then that generation travels further north into the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Eventually, we here in Indiana see the great-grandchildren of the parents that start out in Mexico. So we get the F3 and F4 generation. And those are the ones that we get the benefit of having here. Now, when these guys are gathered in their locations where they're going to be say in Mexico or California, you can actually see them in huge colonies of monarchs. And this picture really is a great picture because it kind of demonstrates it. You can also find videos on YouTube or even sometimes you'll find them on like the Discovery Channel or something where someone's filming them. And it's an absolutely gorgeous thing to see, seeing hundreds of thousands of monarchs gathered on trees in Mexico or California hanging off of them. Um, I, I hope one day I get the chance to see it in person myself. So what's going to happen? We have monarchs now in Indiana. They've traveled, they've gone through their migration. So now it's coming to the end of the season. So now they're gonna migrate back. And what's going to happen is those F3 and F4 generation monarch butterflies are beginning to travel south because they've loaded up on energy here in Indiana and other places they go. And they're going to follow the winds down south. They're going to reproduce one more time into the F5 generation in Texas. And then they're going to complete their migration and overwinter in Mexico, where they're all going to be gathered in those big colonies. Now, there is a problem with this though. And this is why I wanted to tell, talk to you guys about the biology of the monarchs. Unfortunately, climate change is going to be making an impact on the monarchs and their migratory pattern. And this is unavoidable at this point. Um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen to them. There is no study that's going to give you a straight answer on it, but a few of them have come to a few very consistent conclusions. What's going to happen is as we warm, 
climate change is going to affect the distribution of the Asclepias host plants, of the milkweed host plants that they rely on. We, there are also a few studies that indicate that rising temperatures may alter the bodies of monarchs based on their food source and make it more difficult for them to migrate. So I'm gonna go into those right now. So let's talk about the distribution changes. So as our temperatures rise, we're going to see milkweed availability go down the further south you are in the United States. So as they get to Texas and areas like that, all of a sudden their availability of milkweed is going to begin disappearing because it's much, much warmer. As they travel north, they're going to be able to find more milkweed, but it's going to force them to have less food as they travel, and they won't be able to get to the plants they need until they go even further north than they normally do. So that means they're going to be facing an extended migration as they have to go further and further north with less food as they go. And as you can imagine, that's probably going to make an impact on the abundance of monarchs throughout the areas we normally see them. It's also why it's so important that we continue to plant milkweed and try to support that plant so that way monarchs have stopover points where they can get food. Now, like I said, none of this is guaranteed. However, as someone who has researched host plant relationships, I find this to be a very, very likely scenario. To me, I believe that this is something that will almost certainly happen. Now, the next thing that I was talking about, the morphological changes, um, a few studies have indicated this, but primarily in a lab, so we don't know how it's going to look in reality in nature. So one study found that monarchs, when they consumed food that have higher uh, amounts of that secondary compound in milkweed, cardolinide, or cardolinide, excuse me, um, it began to alter their wing shape. Um, what they did is they tested using tropical milkweed which thrives more in warmer habitats. So you can imagine the logic here is that it's gonna be warmer, tropical milkweed might become more abundant and the butterflies are going to consume that. And what they found is that when they did and hatched out into their adult form, their wings became rounder and less suited to gliding. So still capable of flight, however, the effort to migrate would have been more now because they need more energy to make wings that are that shape work correctly. Um, However, like I said, this needs to be more confirmed in a natural environment, in my opinion. This was done in a laboratory, so we don't know if this is going to happen or not. However, I do find the distribution of milkweed will probably change, and that is something that I think is very much going to happen. Okay, so one, uh, just a little bit more before I pass it off to Tabby, one thing I like to do is I like to make a comparison because there are lots of butterflies that resemble monarchs. One of them that I like to cover is the viceroy butterfly. So you are looking at a viceroy butterfly right now, and it looks real close to a monarch. So let me show you a monarch now. This is a monarch butterfly. You've been seeing this guy on your screen for most of it. And you can see he's got uh, large orange spots on his wings, and he has several white dots on his body and head. But if we go to our viceroy, you can see that those large, those white dots on the body really aren't there, and there are no large orange spots like there are on the, on the monarch butterfly. So what is going on here is that this is what we refer to as Mullerian mimicry. So the viceroy, what it does is it doesn't consume the same plants that a monarch does. It consumes plants like willows and cottonwoods, which have a high salicylic acid content. Just like the monarch, they sequester that uh, compound in their bodies, and they get that same color in their wings and on their bodies, and they're also very, very distasteful to predators. That Mullerian mimicry, what they're doing is they're borrowing the benefit of the monarch, because all predators know monarchs taste bad, don't eat them. So they're using that same color patterning and saying, I'm really distasteful too, don't eat me and they're getting that extra benefit. So that way, viceroys are telling that everybody that I'm just as bad as the monarch is. And you can see that probably carry on through all kinds of butterflies, like our admirals and other species that are, kind of resemble monarch butterflies. So I think that's just some neat facts that I like to share with all of you. Um, there are several organizations that are going to be watching out for our monarch butterflies. One of the biggest ones is monarchwatch.org. There are also several other ones. Um, I just wanted to give you an example 
These organizations are going to be dedicated to helping you get seeds from milkweed, um, helping you watch for monarchs and do a little bit of citizen science, recording how many monarchs you see and sharing that. Um, and I encourage all of you to look into these groups. You can always email I or Tabby afterwards, and we'd be more than happy to help you find some of them and show you what they can do. So please feel free to do that. Um, with that, there's my contact information. Um, and this is, this, is going, this is being recorded, so you're going to be able to see this in the recording as well. And you got my email as well, so you have all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and I'm going to let Tabby go ahead and get started with hers. There you go. Tabby, you should have co-host privileges now. All right. So you guys have gotten your basics about monarchs and um, their biology from Bob. And I am going to go into a little bit about how to encourage them in your lawn and garden and how to deal with having pollinators in your garden and not concern yourself with what they may or may not be doing damage wise. And can you guys see my screen okay? Yep, you're coming through just fine. All right. So first we're going to talk about lawn and garden care and how to use less pesticides to promote beneficial insect health without encouraging pests in our area. Because while we wanna help our pollinators, we still do wanna have a nice looking lawn and garden. So insects are often seen as a bad thing in lawns and gardens. Um, some insects, but they can be a really good indicator of a healthy ecosystem. So we don't necessarily wanna get rid of all of them. We just wanna get rid of the ones that are causing significant damage. And if we think about the definition of a pest, a pest is a plant, animal, or organism that is out of place. And that can be very dependent on your personal preference, um, how you were raised, what you're trying to accomplish in your lawn and garden. So there are lots of different things that you or I might consider a pest that your neighbor or your friend is not going to consider a pest. So some insects can be good and some insects can be bad and some can do a little bit of both. And we just kind of have to outweigh, you know, what we want to see in regards to our pollinators and our habitats. So we want to learn to live with a little bit of imperfection. Maybe not concern yourself too much with leaves being chewed on and focus more on they're not being disease in your fields or things like that. So we can do this with cultural and mechanical control. So learning to live with imperfection. Brown spots in a lawn aren't always the end of the world. Um, we've all had that neighbor, or maybe we are that neighbor who wants that perfectly green uniform lawn that is only grass with no dandelions or anything like that. And we don't wanna see brown spots because we know, we know how we have grubs feeding on the roots. Um, we just want that green lawn. Um, but that's not necessarily the best lawn to keep. Brown spots aren't the worst thing in the world. There are lots of things that look less appealing than that. And a dandelion here or there, to me, is something that my pollinators can come and get nectar and pollen from. My neighbor might think otherwise, but I don't think they're the worst thing. Weeds on the property edge. So if you have a very large piece of property and maybe you want to keep the lawn nice around your house, you can let the areas go that you're not gonna have a lot of foot traffic or somewhere along a fence row that you're not gonna be seeing these things. And that's going to allow our pollinators to have a food source, to have something that's not being chemically treated that they can get out there and utilize to the best of their advantages. We can also work on flower gardens with a few pests. So we can't always eliminate insects. They're never gonna be something that we can just completely get rid of. And so because of that, we have to learn that having a couple here or there is not the worst thing in the world. Um, I love dill and fennel, but I also know that my swallowtails love dill and fennel. So am I going to look the other way when they're feeding on it? Absolutely. And leaves with holes. Not all leaves have to be perfect. And if you can handle looking at a couple holes here or there, it's not going to be the end of your garden. With cultural controls, we can look at things like the best planting dates and harvest times. So insects, whether we're trying to control the good or the bad, um, they rely on certain things being available at certain points in their life cycle. There are lots of insects that can utilize things that get planted late, so we want to make sure we plant things at the best appropriate time. Uh, last year here in Indiana, we saw a really big outbreak of 
fall armyworm. And fall armyworm really likes late planted crops. So if corn or soybeans don't go in until super late, they're gonna go after those crops that are in the ground later because they're gonna be greener later. And that also goes with our alfalfa and hay and our green, green lawns. The later in the season we have these very fresh green things growing, that's what those armyworms are gonna look after. So we wanna make sure that we're planting and harvesting at the correct times to kind of eliminate that range when we're gonna see a lot of the pests that we would consider in our area. We can use resistant varieties. So if you want to use less chemicals in your garden, but you don't want some insects that are gonna be showing up, there are lots of different available options for resistant varieties, whether they be something with BT in them or some other type of control. We have a lot of options there. We can also look at rotating crops. So if we have insect pests that we know show up every year and they overwinter in the soil, rotating where we keep our crops or rotating where we plant our flowers can change a lot of their life cycle and eliminate them having the opportunity to reinfest the following years. We can also plant things that are naturally insect repellent. And there are lots of plants that do that. And a lot of them are our herbs. So things you can use in your kitchen every day. Uh, we're gonna go over a couple of them here for marigolds. They're really good at controlling plant lice, mosquitoes, and even rabbits. So planting marigolds around your garden is definitely going to deter any insect damage that's gonna be coming in, but they're full of flowers. So you're gonna see lots of pollinators coming into the area. You can plant them in your flower beds, near your front or back door, or even in your vegetable garden. And that's going to keep the rabbits and other insects away from harming your plants. Chrysanthemums are kind of the same. They're probably the best plant that works for deterring insects. They work on ants, Japanese beetles, roaches, bed bugs, spider mites, ticks, silverfish, harlequin bugs, and many, many others. Uh, they just have naturally occurring chemicals and compounds that these insects don't like to feed on. They don't like to smell it. So they're gonna stay away from those areas, but you are going to see pollinators coming to the flowers. Some of our herbs, mint is a plant that can rep repel spiders, ants, and mosquitoes, but be careful when you plant mint because they spread very rapidly. So make sure if you're using mint, you are putting it in a pot or in some sort of controlled location that you can kind of keep it from getting out of hand. Basil repels mosquitoes and houseflies, and you may even put some plants by your back door to discourage insects from coming inside. And that gives you also easy access for basil when you want to use it in your cooking. Citronella grass, everyone knows that citronella is an ingredient we use in lots of chemical deterrents for insects, and not a lot of people know that it comes from a grass. You can plant this grass in your garden, you can have it in a planter near your door, um, it grows really well in most of the Midwest, so you should do well to plant citronella grass and get some insect control in your lawn and garden. Lavender is another good one. Uh, it works really well against our flying pests, so gnats and mosquitoes. They hate the smell of it, and many people love it, so it's a wonderful addition to your lawn and garden. If you're planting it around your doors uh, with open windows, you can smell it, and it's just kind of a lovely scent. Chives work really well against Japanese beetles and carrot rust flies. So if you've got those on your property and you've been noticing issues with them, you can plant some chives. That's going to help deter them from the area. Petunias add color to your yard while repelling asparagus beetles, leafhoppers, and various kinds of aphids, tomato worms, and a variety of other pests. So that's another one that lots of people like to use just because they are so lovely and you can plant them just about anywhere. Bay leaves. This plant will repel flies, and if you have a roach problem, you can also use them to deter roaches in your kitchen. Garlic is known for its health benefits and seasoning, and garlic plant also deters Japanese beetles, root maggots, carrot root flies, codling moths, and can be planted near roses to repel aphids from eating your flowers. Rosemary is another really good one. Uh, I grow a lot of rosemary. I use it a lot in my kitchen, but it's also really good at repelling insect pests from around my vegetable plants. So I just kind of plant it around the base of the plants and the chemical smells um, coming off of it are enough to keep the insects away. So there are lots of different herbs you can use. And again, marigolds and chrysanthemums, both lovely options.
With mechanical controls, there are lots of different things we can do. So mechanical means we are manually doing something to control our insects. And that can be as simple as removing pests from plants. It could be pulling weeds that are harboring pests in the garden. You can put cages on your cabbage and other veggies like we see here in this photo. And you can use sticky traps if you've got problems with white flies hanging around in your trees or shrubs. And one thing that I do in my garden that I know is not gonna be popular along, among a lot of people who have vegetable gardens, but when we get tomato worms, um, I do go and pick all the tomato worms off of my plants. But also in our garden, we have a compost pile. And I let that compost pile grow whatever weird vegetables are growing from seed that has been brought out of the kitchen or a rotten fruit. And I get tomato plants and they're never producing things that I want to eat. The tomatoes are always super weird. Uh, they're a cross of everything I've got out in the garden, but I will remove my tomato worms from my planted tomato plants and put them in my compost tomato plants. And that way I'm keeping the pollinators happy. They're getting food, they're turning into moths. Those moths do very great things for pollinating overnight, uh, but I'm also keeping them off the plants that I don't want them on. So if you've got the time, it's not the worst thing in the world. Many people would not agree with what I do, but that's how I control my tomato worms. So in general, there are lots of different sprays we can use that are effective against most small soft body arthropods, such as aphids, young scales, white flies, psyllids, mealybugs, and spider mites. And larger insects like caterpillars, sawflies, and beetle larvae generally are immune to soapy sprays. So we can use soaps if we're seeing issues with some of these smaller insects and be able to deal with those. But that's going to not really work so well on our larger insects like box elder bugs and Japanese beetles. Um, other things you can use, we can put out Japanese beetle traps, but make sure that if you're using those, you're keeping them very far away from where you're trying to keep them out of. Those traps do have a pheromone um, associated with them that's going to bring in beetles. So if you've got Japanese beetles in your garden, make sure you put that Japanese beetle trap far away from your garden so they're leaving the garden area. You can remove some smaller pests with water. So you can just use a hose and spray them off. We can put diatomaceous earth around the base of our plants and that ensures that any insect crawling through that diatomaceous earth is um, going to get scraped up and eventually dehydrate to death before they can do too much damage to our plants. Again, the soap sprays, we can release by uh, beneficial insects. So things like ladybugs, praying mantises, and lacewings are all very good predatory insects you can have in your garden that are gonna control some of these pests that we encounter. So now that we know how to keep the bad insects away and what we can do at home that is going to have a minimal cost to our pollinators, let's talk a little bit about attracting our monarchs. So there are lots of things that monarchs need and just like you or I, they need food and water. So we wanna make sure we're giving them those things. Providing nectar rich flowers for adults is a good way to get them in your area. So we wanna make sure there are lots of flowers around that's going to attract them. Um, they love a lot of our native species of flowers. So you don't have to plant anything fancy. You can collect seeds from fields or um, field edges, ditches, things like that, and plant flowers that the monarchs are going to love to come to. We also wanna make sure they have a water source. And not many people think about insects drinking, but they do have to drink just like you or I. You can use things like bird baths. Um, however, monarchs and our bees are really prone to drowning in bird baths because they're a little too deep. And if they get in a little too far, they're not gonna be able to get back out. So what you can do is make a, it's called a bird or butterfly bath. And you put stones in the bottom of what would be a bird bath. And this provides um, some shallow water that the insects can climb up out of if they do happen to fall into it. And then we want to provide a number of host plants. So we are providing them food, we're giving them water, but we also need to make sure that they have the plants they need for the larva to grow and succeed on. And what we're talking about here are, are different milkweed plants. So make sure you have those in your area. Um, you can plant them in your garden, they could be in a ditch, but do make sure that you've got some of those plants available for your monarchs to lay eggs on. One of my favorite plants um, for monarchs are the nectar rich flowers. Um, Culver's root is super beautiful. Uh, they have a really white flower. They're a perennial, so they'll come back year after year. 
and they, they bloom spring to early summer. So they're out for most of the summer. They get about four to seven feet tall, which can be a little bit too much for a lot of people. So I make sure that mine are far away from structures or things like that where they're going to bend. Um, I don't want them leaning into the road or something like that where they'll be in the way. And they're a native species. So they're one that you can plant and not be worried about them becoming invasive. The next one is stiff tickweed. This is another native species. It's another perennial and it blooms spring to early summer. These get about three feet tall and I'm sure you've seen them. Um, they grow roadside all over the place in Indiana. They're pretty yellow flowers. They're really drought tolerant. They do excellent in poor soil, which is why we see them so often in ditches and roadsides. Um, that area is not necessarily the best for growing plants, but they do really well there. Hori verbena is the next one, and this is another perennial, another native species. They bloom all summer long. They get about four feet tall. They have these really pretty purple flowers, and they're also a host plant for the common buckeye. So while you can be feeding your pollinators with these lovely purple flowers, you can also be feeding the caterpillars of our buckeyes, which we have a lot of in Indiana. Eastern purple coneflower is the next one. Lots of people recognize this flower, grow this flower. Um, it does really well in Indiana and it's also a native plant. It's another perennial. It blooms all summer long and they get about two to five feet tall. So they're a little um, on the taller side. They can be, it depends on how much sunshine they're getting, you know, how tall those plants are gonna be. And they have these really pretty attractive purple to pink flowers. So they look really lovely in landscaping. They attract a number of native butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. So they're really great for our pollinators. Next up is tall blazing star. This is another perennial, another native species. And they bloom summer to fall. So these are kind of picking up the slack where our previously mentioned flowers are falling off. So the previous ones are gonna go through midsummer to late summer. These ones are going summer to fall. So we're getting that continuation throughout the rest of the year. Uh, our tall blazing star gets about three feet tall and they have these really pretty purple to pink flowers and they're very drought tolerant. So that, especially that late summer when we're not getting as much rain as we normally do, they're gonna do just fine there. And monarchs absolutely love them. Uh, they like the color, they have lots of nectar and pollen. So we see monarchs flocking to these things. Next up is the common button bush. Uh, lots of people choose button bush in their landscaping. It's a very attractive woody shrub, even without the flowers. Um, it's going to be a nice green foliage. These bloom throughout the summer and they can get up to 12 feet tall. So they, they are on the larger side. Make sure you have adequate space if you're planning to put in a, but, a button bush. They have these really unique looking white ball flowers and they're very fragrant. You can smell them from pretty far away and they attract a number of different butterfly species as well as other pollinators. And this is another native plant. So when we talk about our plants and attracting insects or attracting butterflies, we specifically wanna mention milkweed. Not only is it a host plant for our monarchs, so they need it for the larval development for our caterpillars to feed on, uh, but the adults also need milkweed flowers. They like to feed on them. We have 73 different species of milkweed native to North America. Nine of those species are native to the Midwest and four species are preferred over others as far as gardeners are concerned. And those four, four are swamp milkweed, common milkweed, world milkweed, and butterfly milkweed. So the first three I mentioned are more of a dark color. Uh, we're gonna look at some pictures here and then the butterfly is an orange. So most host plant preference um, for monarchs can change throughout the season. So planting a variety of different kinds of milk plant is going to benefit your monarch population. So here's our first one. This is swamp milkweed. It's a perennial, it's native. It has very lovely summer blooms and they get about three to six feet tall. So they have these purplish pink flowers and they are a little on the wetter side. So if you've got an area that's kind of low lying or maybe along a lake or a pond, this would be a perfect addition to that landscape. We have common milkweed. This is the one we see the most throughout Indiana. It's another perennial. It blooms all summer long. It gets about three to six feet tall and it also has purplish pink flowers, uh, but it prefers a little more sandy dry soil. It can do really well in lots of soil types. So don't 
disconcerted. If you don't have sandy soil, it'll do well in just about any habitat. They're very fragrant. You can smell them from pretty far away and they can spread by rhizomes. So lots of farmers have milkweed in their fields um, and they see it as a nuisance. It's a weed to them. So if you were to go out and dig milkweed plants up out of your farm field on the neighboring side, I'm sure the farmers would not complain too much. World milkweed is a white milkweed. Uh, these are perennial plants that bloom all summer long again. They get about half a feet, half a foot to three feet tall. So they're a little on the shorter side for our milkweeds. And they do have these whitish green flowers. They're really drought tolerant, so they can handle those really dry um, months we go through in the late summer, but they do need larger stands to be able to accommodate a monarch caterpillar population. Um, you can see here in this picture, they don't have a lot of leaf size to them, so uh, lots of leaves are needed to feed one caterpillar, let alone 10 or 20. So making sure you have a large area to plant this if you're choosing it for your landscaping. And then lastly, we have our butterfly milkweed. This is one, uh, it's one of my favorites. It's a bright orange flower. They are a perennial. They bloom all summer long. We see them a lot in roadsides, especially where they've been replanting pollinator habitat. They love to use this one because it is so bright in color. They get about a foot to two feet tall and they're really drought tolerant again. So they do well uh, late summer here in Indiana. And they're super easy to grow from seeds. So we've talked about providing food and water and pollinator habitat for our monarchs, but there are other things we need in addition to that. We need to provide them a safe place for chrysalis. So if we're providing caterpillar habitat and food, we wanna make sure that those caterpillars have a safe place to metamorphosize. And that can be trees, shrubs, they'll use your garden decorations. If you have potted plants, you can find them hanging on things like that. They'll use fences, they'll use buildings. Uh, I've had a client call and had one on the side of their car. Um, they will use anything they can get to. So make sure that when you um, have this pollinator habitat and you've provided it for monarchs and you know that you have caterpillars, make sure you're checking before you bring in pots, uh, before you cut down shrubs or things like that, before you trim back branches, check them over and make sure you're not finding chrysalises because we want to make sure that they have a chance to um, finish their life cycle. If you do have them showing up on things, that you need to relocate them on. You can simply snip whatever they're on off if it's a branch or something like that. And if it's not, you can just cut that little section you see where it is attached to the tree or structure or whatever they're on. And then you can just uh, put a sewing needle through it with thread and tie it up on some other thing that they can um, hang out on and not be in anybody's way. So an overview, we wanna make sure that we're using less pesticides that's gonna benefit our pollinators. We're learning to live with our imperfections. So leaves with holes are not the worst thing. We're using cultural and mechanical controls on our insects we don't want in our lawn and garden. We're going to plant nectar rich native plants. Native plants are always the best. They are the ones who are best suited for our habitat and that our native species are most familiar with. We want to make sure we plant milkweed so that we have plenty of food for our caterpillars and we wanna make sure we plant a variety so that the changing seasons don't deter monarchs from laying eggs in our area. And then we wanna provide chrysalis safety. So be on the lookout for those chrysalises in odd places and make sure you move them to somewhere safe. So Bob mentioned earlier, some opportunities uh, for citizen science and to learn more about monarchs. Here are four different citizen science projects that you can take part in. And they're all wonderful projects to be a part of. Citizen science is a collection of scientific data by individuals who are not professional scientists. So it's you or I or anybody you know that wants to help scientists in their research. Professional bio biologists from the land management agency prepare the individuals for work as citizen science. These projects are ongoing and consist of a network of volunteers. Citizen science networks are very important. The citizen science monitoring program would not be so successful without the participation of us as citizen science. So they're relying a lot on their volunteers to make sure that they are collecting enough data to be scientifically relevant. Without these dedicated volunteers, too few data would be collected to accomplish research objectives. Much of what has been learned about the monarch butterfly and its migration is a result of citizen science. 
So it's the result of people watching and monitoring and noticing their populations in their local area and reporting that on to someone who can gather the data together. So if you guys want to know more about citizen science, you're welcome to contact Bob or I. Here's my contact information, my email at the bottom. And with that, I think Bob and I will take any questions you guys might have.